It was almost midnight on Saturday, March 29, 2008. In the lobby of the London building, a condominium in the Villa Guillerme district of Sao Paulo, Brazil, the doorkeeper was preparing for yet another long and uneventful night. Being that the neighborhood was almost entirely residential, it got extremely quiet and peaceful after nightfall. The man was looking for ways to kill time when he heard a loud thud coming from outside the building. Wondering what could possibly have caused the noise, he left the guardroom and went outside to investigate. He had only walked a few steps when he stopped in shock, seeing at his feet the cause of the commotion. Laying on the grass in the garden, directly beneath the windows on that side of the building, was the motionless body of a little girl. In the meantime, one of the residents, awakened by the noise, had walked outside on his balcony. Seeing the child on the ground below, he immediately contacted the authorities. Moments later, the girl's father rushed out of the building and went to kneel next to his daughter, pressing his ear against her chest to hear whether she was still breathing. As soon as paramedics arrived on the scene, they realized that the girl was still alive, but was going into cardiac arrest, and immediately began performing life-saving measures, which went on for several minutes before she was loaded into an ambulance and rushed to the hospital. Unfortunately, her body had already sustained too much damage and she passed away during the journey. The victim was soon identified as five-year-old Isabella Nardoni. She'd been born in 2002 to her father Alexander and his ex-girlfriend Anna Carolina de Oliveira, who was 17 at the time. The two had met in school and dated for three years before she unexpectedly became pregnant. After Isabella was born, the couple had briefly given thought to the possibility of moving in together, but at the time the relationship was already starting to deteriorate. Also, Alexander, being a student, was still financially dependent on his father. So, Anna Carolina decided to stay to live with her parents with the baby. The couple separated permanently only a few months later, after Alexander was caught cheating on Anna Carolina with one of his colleagues in law school and the two agreed on a custody schedule that saw Isabella spending with him two weekends per month. By the time the girl was five, Alexandra was married to his former colleague, 24-year-old Anna Carolina Jatoba, and in the past three years, the family had expanded, welcoming two baby boys into the world. Saturday, March 29, was one of the days Isabella was supposed to be spending with her dad, and on that occasion, the family had decided to go pay a visit to Anna Carolina's parents in the nearby city of Guarulhos. They had just returned home late that night when something terrible happened, leading to the child falling off the sixth floor of the building and eventually losing her life. The day after Isabella's death, Mr. and Mrs. Nardoni were accompanied to the local police station to be interviewed about what had just occurred. Alexander told detectives that, when they got home, the three kids were already asleep, so he left the car in the parking lot, picked up Isabella and went up to their apartment, where he put her to bed, before going back down to help his wife with the boys. When they returned to the sixth floor, only five to ten minutes later, they found that the apartment's door, which Alexander had locked, was open. Worried, the man rushed to his daughter's room, where he discovered with horror that the girl was no longer in her bed. Starting to fear for the worst, he then moved to the boy's room. There, he noticed that someone had cut open a hole into the safety net that covered the window. So he got closer and inserted his head into the hole to get a better view of the ground below. That's when he saw his beloved baby laying motionless on the grass. When she was interviewed a few hours later, Anna Carolina confirmed her husband's story, that someone had broken into the house while Alexander was helping her with the kids and had thrown Isabella out the window. While authorities interviewed them, investigators on the scene began collecting evidence, soon confirming that the event was in fact a homicide. Using a human-sized doll to emulate the fall, they were able to determine that if it had been an accident, she would have probably fallen closer to the base of the building, and if she jumped, she would have landed further. Instead, the position in which the body was found was consistent with the theory that someone had dropped her on purpose. Further evidence was acquired inside the apartment and in Alexander's car, where crime scene investigators found traces of blood. While in the room from which Isabella was dropped, they found that someone had left a footprint on the bed directly below the window. 
As for Alexandre and Anna's claims that someone had broken into the house, authorities were unable to find any signs of burglary. Also, despite searching the building from top to bottom and combing through surveillance footage, no trace was ever found indicating that someone might have illegally entered the property. Among the ever-increasing amount of evidence collected by police, it was perhaps the autopsy that revealed the most crucial elements. After having examined Isabella's body, the coroner was able to ascertain that the leading cause of the girl's death hadn't been the fall, but instead asphyxiation, which occurred before she was dropped from the apartment. In addition to a hip fracture caused by the fall, the body showed another fracture on her right wrist and a cut on her forehead, both of which were determined to not be related to the drop. Also, her tongue was swollen and her nails had taken on a purplish color, and there were markings on her lungs and heart, all telltale signs of asphyxiation. The leading theory was that whoever had committed the murder had suffocated and possibly beaten the child, thus causing the broken wrist and the cut on the forehead, before dropping her from the window. Based on the evidence found, although most of it was circumstantial, and on testimony from Isabella's mom, Alexandre and Anna Carolina were temporarily arrested on April 2nd. The arrest shocked many of those who knew the family, as Alexandre was known as a wonderful father who loved his daughter unconditionally. Isabella's grandfather spoke on the day of the funeral, saying, Isabella loved her parents, there's no explanation for what happened. Some, however, including neighbors and a few of the couple's former colleagues at university, painted quite a different picture, saying that the relationship between husband and wife had always been precarious and characterized by constant and bitter fighting, mostly due to the woman's jealousy of Isabella's mom and of the girl herself. The situation with Anna Carolina was apparently so bad that Alexander's family members were afraid of leaving Isabella alone with her, to the point that whenever the father wasn't at home, on the days that the girl would spend with them, his sister came over and stayed until he returned. A neighbor recalled being told by Alexander's mother that Anna Carolina was crazy and shouldn't be left with the stepdaughter. On top of all this, from the police records emerged that two complaints were filed by Anna Carolina in 2004 and 2005, in which she accused Alexander of assaulting her over trivial matters. The day following the couple's initial arrest, the spouses published letters handwritten by them in which they denied having anything to do with Isabella's death and reaffirmed how much they loved her. Alexander wrote, Isabella was my treasure. I have other sons, but she was the princess of the house. On the same note, Anna Carolina said, I know the word stepmother can sound unpleasant to some people, but for Isa, I was Auntie Carol. I loved her like I love my boys. After a few days in custody on the 11th of April, the couple's lawyer managed to get them released, on the basis that no formal charge had been presented yet. Meanwhile, the case was getting huge amounts of attention from the press and the general public all over Brazil, with the latter clearly taking sides against the couple. Having concluded their investigation, on May 6, the public prosecutor charged Alexandre Nardoni and Anna Carolina Jotoba with voluntary manslaughter stating that both were responsible for the killing. The two were also charged with procedural fraud because, according to the prosecution, they had taken action to conceal their doing by cleaning the house, thus altering the crime scene. After these charges were filed, the spouses were once again taken into custody, kicking off a trial that would have lasted two years. Over the course of the long months of testimonies, new details were revealed further incriminating the suspects. According to the experts who worked on the case, the traces of blood found in the house and in the car matched with Isabella's. Also, fragments of the same material the safety net was made of were found on the clothes Alexander was wearing on the day his daughter died, and on a pair of scissors discovered in the apartment. On the same note, the footprint left on the bed linen was consistent with the shoes the man was wearing. Lastly, investigators had tried reenacting the whole incident, considering that the GPS on Alexander's car had been turned off at 11.36 p.m. and the first call for aid had been placed at 11.49. Police estimated that Isabella was left alone in the house for only about 5 of those 13 minutes and deemed highly unlikely that, in such a short amount of time, a potential intruder could have forced the door open, suffocated the girl until she passed out 
cut a hole in the net on the window and drop the child, before vanishing leaving no trace behind. Instead, according to their reconstruction, it had been Anna Carolina motivated by jealousy, who had beaten and choked the child. The aggression had apparently started in the car before continuing into the apartment, from where Alexandra had dropped her to make it look like someone else is doing. Supporting this thesis, there was also the fact that Isabella hadn't fallen from the window in the room where she was sleeping, but instead from the adjacent brother's room. This because the ground below her window was a concrete pavement, and so if she landed there, her body would have been way more severely damaged, which was consistent with the idea that whoever committed the crime was only looking to sway investigators and didn't want the girl's body to be completely destroyed. Besides the evidence presented by prosecutors, other testimonies pointed at the parents as the perpetrators. Neighbors stated that, in those fatal moments, they had apparently heard a child screaming something to the effect of Stop, daddy, stop! While another resident recounted having briefly spoken with the couple's eldest son, three-years-old Pietro, who was sobbing in the garden on the night of the tragedy. The man had asked the child if someone else had been in the apartment, to which the boy answered they had not. However, the evidence provided by these testimonies was all circumstantial or not provable. Among the many days in court, March 22, 2010 revealed itself to be one of the most intense, as Isabella's mother took the stand to tell the jury about her baby, whom she described as a joyful, extroverted child who loved showering others with happiness. With her eyes filled with tears, Anna Carolina spoke of Isabella's love for ballet and how her dream of becoming a dancer had been tragically cut short. In her testimony, she also revealed details of the relationship she had with Alexandre, stating that the man could be violent at times, and on one occasion he had even threatened to kill her and her mother and escape with Isabella, over a trivial matter regarding the girl's enrollment into a school. Despite the large amount of clues pointed at the defendants, the trial remained extremely controversial, as the prosecution based their case mostly on forensic and circumstantial evidence, and because some contradictions in witness testimonies led some to believe that Mr. and Mrs. Nardoni were being set up. For example, one of the main talking points early on had been the fact that a construction worker who lived at the back of the building had told reporters that on the night of the murder he'd seen someone sneak onto the property. However, when he testified at the trial, he denied everything. In the end, on March 27, 2010, a jury found both defendants to be guilty of Isabella's murder. Anna Carolina Jatoba was sentenced to 26 years and 8 months in prison, while Alexandre Nardoni got 31 years and 1 month. Against the man waited the fact that he was the victim's father. In addition, the two were convicted of procedural fraud for having tampered with evidence to 8 months of imprisonment, both sentences to be served concurrently. Years later, in 2014, a Sao Paulo Department of Corrections employee, who had worked in the same prison in which Anna Carolina was detained, came forward with the allegation that lawyer Antonio Nardoni, Alexandra's father, may have been involved with the murder. According to the woman, she'd overheard Anna Carolina talking about how the events had actually unfolded, and saying that, once they had gotten to the apartment, they thought Isabella was already dead, after being attacked in the car. It was then that the woman called her husband's father, a lawyer who allegedly told them to stage an accident to avoid being arrested. Then they got the idea of throwing the girl out the window, which Alexandra agreed to do solely because he believed that she was dead, only to be left devastated when he went down and realized that his daughter was still alive. However, Antonio Nardoni denied his involvement and was never charged by authorities. This was the story of Isabella Nardoni. Thank you for staying till the end, I hope you found the video to be interesting. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe to support the channel, and leave a comment below if you have any opinion on the case or suggestion for future videos, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.